قل هذه سبيلي أدعو إلى الله على بصيرة أنا ومن اتبعني وسبحان الله وما أنا من المشركين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وآله وصحبه ومن اهتدى بهداه أما بعد Dear brothers and sisters in Islam السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته and welcome to this live episode of Ask Zad coming to you every Saturday between Maghrib and Isha time here in Mecca region As usual we will take three of your questions from the emails So the first question is from Azib He says Ya Shaykh, people praying with chair in rows break the row. How should one place his chair if he's praying in rows? If there is no place in the masjid specifically for this. That's a valid question. And to answer your question, Azib, we say that I as an individual, what am I obliged to do? Regardless of everyone else, I'm supposed to pray in the masjid when I'm capable and I am a male. So I am praying in the masjid. I have a problem with my knees, with my back, with any other injury. I can't prostrate or at least I cannot sit in prayer normally. I have to sit on a chair. So what to do? Initially, I am obliged while standing to stand in line. Yes or no? The answer is yes. But, no, 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 don't but me. Rather, list, listen to the end. If I am originally ordered and instructed to pray in the line, because when the Prophet saw, alayhi salam, one of his companions a little bit ahead of the line, he poked him with a stick in his hand so that he would stand in line. So the chest of the worshippers, their shoulders are aligned. So this is what I'm obliged to do. Now in order to have this, I need my chair to be behind me, which would mean that the row behind me, there can't be a person capable of praying right behind me because he would not have a place to prostrate in. So what is the alternative? Number one, what are the choices on the table? Number one, I don't pray in the masjid. This is not a valid choice. Number two, that I stand half a meter ahead of the row. Again, this is not permissible because the Prophet prohibited me from doing so. Option number three, that I pray normally and the one behind me has the option of either praying behind me and when he wants to prostrate, he goes one step backwards, and this might not be feasible, or they squeeze themselves to prostrate, or they leave the gap open. Option number four is to choose a very tiny, small chair that could fit right underneath me, and it would not take a huge space from the row behind. This is a win-win situation. Option number five, which is very convenient and possible, but a lot of the people are lazy to do it, is that once you want to sit on the chair, you simply drag the chair half a meter in front while stepping forward and sit. So behind you, there is normal space in the row for a person behind you to prostrate. Once you stand up, give it a few seconds until you clear that the one behind you has stood up, then you get the seat back to where it was and you stand in the row and Allah Azza wa Jal knows best. The second question is from Hassan and Hassan says, if a person is born in a non-Muslim family, how is, it, how is it his fault for being brought up as a non-Muslim and why would he be thrown in hell for this. To answer your question, Hassan, we have to acknowledge number one. 
Allah is fair. Allah is just. So there is no way for injustice to be inflicted upon that individual. Agree? Of course. You can't disagree because if you do, you'll be thrown in hell for eternity. Allah doesn't put injustice upon people. So we have full conviction that Allah would treat everybody justly. This is why such a question could not come up. Because if that individual who was born in a non-Muslim environment or family would, was not led to Islam, did not hear about Islam, had no knowledge of it, then on the day of judgment, Allah would test him. But if he had the chance and he rejected it, if he heard about Islam and did not research it, though inherently each and every human being has this urge to worship Allah alone, not knowing how, but they have it inherently in them. It's installed in them with their DNA. So if they fail to fulfill that, they hear about the Quran, they hear about Islam, they hear about the Muslims, they see how they pray, they see their highly moral conduct and behavior and ethics. There's so many things to praise about them, but mm, they shrug their shoulders and move on. They don't want to. In this case, they have to pay the price for that and Allah knows best. Finally, a questioner says, I heard the dead feel the pain even if a fly sits on its body. They say this is because of the hadith, breaking the bone of one who is dead is like breaking it when he is alive. Does this hadith indicate that the dead people feel extreme pain when their bones are broken? The answer is no. The hadith is referring to how to respect the corpse of a deceased person. After the soul is extracted at the time of death, the person who died does not see or feel his body when it's being washed, transported, shrouded, prayed upon, placed in the grave. He regains his hearing and feeling once the soul is placed back for questioning. And this is when he hears the flip-flop or the shoes of those who, who had just buried him leaving the graveyard. And then he's questioned by the two angels and he made to sit in his grave in a way that is not resembling anything that we know of in this life because he's dead. So how is this going to happen? How is he going to be tormented or given favors and blessings of Allah in his grave? This is a different phase and stage of life. There is this life on earth, then there is the life in the hereafter for eternity, and in between there is the life of barzakh. This is the life of the barzakh when he's in his grave. We have no knowledge of what's happening, but does the corpse of the deceased feel the pain if we slap it, if a fly falls on it, if someone drops it? No, it does not feel the pain, but the prophet is telling us that the breaking the bone of a dead person is like breaking it when he's alive. I mean, in it having its sanctuary, it, it having its uh, uh, status in Islam to be respected and taken care of and Allah knows best. Amirul from Malaysia. Amirul. Ammar from the UK. Ammar. I hope we don't have any problems with Zoom connection. It appears that we do have a problem. That's why we will have to take a short break. Stay tuned and inshallah, we'll be right back.
Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Today we're going to talk about the book Interactions of the Greatest Leader. Anas ibn Malik, may Allah be pleased with him, said, Out of all the Ansar in Medina, Abu Talha had the most date palm trees, and the most beloved of his land was Bayraha, a piece of land that faces the mosque. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to enter it and drink from some water therein. When the verse which means, never will you attain good reward until you spend in the way of Allah from that which you love, was revealed, Abu Talha stood and said to the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, O Messenger of Allah, the Almighty says, never will you attain good reward until you spend in the way of Allah from that which you love. And the most beloved part of my wealth is Bayraha. Therefore, it is a charity for the sake of Allah. And I hope that Allah accepts it and stores it for me in my record for good deeds. So use it in any way Allah shows you. So the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, This is such a good action. This is profitable wealth. I have heard what you have said, but I see that you should give it to your relative. Abu Talha, may Allah be pleased with him, said, I shall do so, O Messenger of Allah. So Abu Talha divided it between his relatives and cousins, and among them were Hassan and Ubay ibn Ka'b. That is how the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to advise them about which places are more suitable for charity. Reported by Al-Bukhari and Muslim. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and welcome back. So I hope we don't have any problem with your communication. Amirul from Malaysia. Amirul. Hmm. Anybody? Okay, it seems that we still have a problem. So until they fix it, they say take a question from the emails as if I know if we have <laughs> questions or not. Let us see. So, um, hadith. A questioner says, I heard a hadith that says, seek help in having your needs met by being discreet, for everyone who's blessed with something is envied. Does this mean we should not tell others about our upcoming events due to fear of evil eye? The answer is yes. In short, generally speaking, the hadith, استعينوا على إمضاء حوائجكم بالكتمان فإن كل ذي نعمة مغبون. Everyone among us who's favored by Allah is being envied. So if I keep on telling people, listen, tomorrow I'm gonna buy a new car, inevitably one would give me an evil eye without him or me knowing it. It happens, it's something natural. Uh, if I say to people that I'm applying for a job and it has double the salary and benefits and insurance for the parents, blah, 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 again, there is a, pro a possibility of people being envious. So the Prophet وسلم, is telling us to, do, to be discreet. Not that it is prohibited. Yes, I do observe my adhkar in the morning and the evening, but I am not certain about people's intention. And sometimes I might be breaking someone's heart who's not as fortunate as I am. So the hadith is clearly stating that we should uh, try to avoid this to the best of our ability and Allah knows best. The following question is, how was Asiya, 
married to Pharaoh when she was a believer and he was a non-Muslim. Now this question deals with whether the law and Sharia of those before us apply to us or not, and whether our law and Sharia applies, apply to them or not. And the most authentic opinion is that each religion has its own laws. So the question to begin with is beyond comprehension because Pharaoh is a Kafir. And Asya at the time was a disbeliever. She did not have a religion. And she believed in Pharaoh to be a god maybe or whatever. Until Musa came, peace be upon him, and she became a Muslim. First of all. Second of all, if you look at the laws of religions before us, you would find that there are things that were permitted in their religion and abrogated in ours, and now it is not uh, uh, valid anymore in our religion, though it was part of previous religions. For example, in the religion of Prophet Solomon, peace be upon him, he used to have control over the jinn. We can't. He used to have the jinn create and make statues of living creatures, which is prohibited in our religion. In the religion of Yusuf, peace be upon him, it was permissible to prostrate when greeting people of authority, which the siblings of Yusuf did when they came to greet him, when they visited him after repentance. So such things indicate that what was fine in their religion can be abrogated and changed. But what counts is the final sharia, the final law of Allah, which is Islam. And Allah Azza wa Jal knows best. And I hope this answers your question. And let's hope that we have the problem fixed. Uh, Amirul from Malaysia. Amirul. I hope you're not the one causing the problem. Okay, we go to the following one, Ammar from the UK. Recording in progress. Yeah, Ammar, the recording is in progress. Do we have anyone on the line? Ammar? Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillahi wa salatu wa salam wa rasulillah. Welcome, Ammar Bai. What can I do to you? Um, uh, Sheikh, uh, I had a question. Um, some of my friends, like when we talk, uh, they narrate hadith or they share hadith with me. Um, if I hear something really new, I go home and try to check it. What they said is correct or not, um, to check if, if, it, if it's authentic. Um, if it's not, I next day I inform them that what you said is not correct and this and this. But sometimes I'm not able to find out what they said is correct or I'm not able to uh, find any evidence of what the, the hadith they're saying is correct or not. What should I do in this case? Should I just follow what they said or should I uh, refrain from following their advice about a hadith? No, no. Jazak. Akhi, this is normal. We all do this. I do this all the time. I hear something new. I learn it. I go back home. I check. If it's authentic, I apply it. If I could not find it, I trash it. Because if it doesn't exist and I cannot authenticate it or verify it, then I do not put it in my database. I do not uh, uh, digest it because I only take in what is authentic from the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. Anything that's not authentic or I cannot verify, I refrain from accepting it until it's been verified. So yes, if you hear something and you cannot find it, 
ignore it and don't implement it. Amiral from Malaysia. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh, Ya Syekh. Wa alaikum assalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. How are you, Syekh? I'm fine, alhamdulillah. How about yourself? Alhamdulillah, Ya Rabbil Amin. How can I help you, Amir? Mm, may Allah be what give you good. Um, Syekh, I have a, a question regarding dyeing my hair. I'm currently at my 20s, but I just uh, colored my hair. And then all my friends say, you cannot uh, dye your hair because it's not permissible. What color? Say, I, I think it's kind of like uh, brown, but it now turns into slightly blonde. But the blonde, uh, I had no control because it slightly turned out, uh, it became itself blonde. I have no, no control over it. So you don't, have, then, you don't have any affiliation with the K-pop? Uh, no, 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 <laughs> no problem. Uh, yeah, Amirul, there is no problem in dyeing your hair. The Prophet wasallam only prohibited us from using black. So if you dye your hair blonde, if you dye your hair uh, uh, brown, if you dye your hair red, with, when you're using henna or orange, totally permissible. Okay? Uh, Noor from Nigeria. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. How are you, Sheikh? I'm doing great. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. Masha Allah. So, um, yeah, Sheikh, I have a question. I started asking the question, but uh, what is uh, it? Juma what? Asks prayer. When it's... I go regarding Juma, Juma prayer. Okay. So when I go for Juma, sometimes like I go really early before the time before the time enters for Juma prayer. So I I don't know. Can I pray? I see people praying a lot of rakat before the imam comes, before the time enters, but before the sun, sun is above the horizon just after, when the time enters for Zuhur. So I see people praying, a lot of prayers. I don't know, can they pray that, or just the two rakats that you are allowed to pray? Because after that, after when the imam comes and says, uh, Assalamu alaikum, sometimes I see people rise again after they have already prayed their two rakats or more, and then pray again. So I want to know what is allowed, Ya Sheikh, how many prayers can we pray before the Jumat prayer? Okay, uh, Noor, I will answer you, inshallah. First of all, Zuhur prayer, Saturday through Thursday, has four rak'ahs prescribed emphatic sunnah before the fart, and two rak'ahs prescribed emphatic sunnah after the fart. Now, in Jumu'ah, it is an exception. There is an exception. Today is the day of surprises. MashaAllah, everything is going out of order. So what is the exception? The exception is that it is part of the sunnah. Whoever comes early for Friday, that he prays how many rak'ahs he wants. You want to pray two? This is sufficient for you to sit down. You want to pray 10, you want to pray 100, the sky is the limit. Why? Because the Prophet ﷺ told us that this is part of the sunnah for Jumu'ah. Okay, Sheikh, but we know that 10 minutes before the dhuhr, it is a time where it, we should be not praying. This is a prohibition time. Yes, but not for Jumu'ah. There is no prohibition time for Jumu'ah. You pray all the way, no problem. Second part of your question would be, what about if the imam comes and says, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, and sits down, and the muaddin starts to pray. Some people stand up to pray. This is wrong. What they're doing is an innovation. They should sit down. They must not pray. Khalas, the moment the imam says, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, it's over. It's done. They don't pray, and they just sit and listen, and I hope this answers your question. Fuad from Bangladesh. Wa alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum wa barakatuh. How are you, Sheikh? Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, Fuad. What, are, what about you? Alhamdulillah, Sheikh. Hiyak Allah. How can I help you, Akhi? So, Sheikh, my question is, 
if a person uses a toothbrush instead of siwak, will he be entitled to equal the reward? Barakallahu fi It's an issue of dispute among scholars whether this is sufficient or not. And the most authentic opinion is that what is intended is to brush and clean your mouth and teeth. Now, the best way of doing it is using the arak, the miswak, made from this twig. And I know people pay money for this, but alhamdulillah, we're graced and blessed by Allah to find it cheap here and available. If you can't do that, you can use any other form of twig or a normal toothbrush. If you add to that toothpaste, even more better because it gives a nice scent and uh, uh, maybe fragrance, I don't know, to it, it adds value as well. So Alhamdulillah, you will be rewarded for that as well. Yunus from India. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, Sheikh. Wa alaikum as salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh, Sheikh, uh, nowadays uh, in college, Sheikh, uh, graduation ceremonies took place, Sheikh. So, uh, for the students, uh, is it permissible to wear black robe and black hat on that day, Sheikh? Okay. Wa jazakum. So, this question is an issue of dispute. People, when graduating, they tend to wear these black robes and put these square hats with uh, things dangling from it to receive their certificate in a ceremony. So what's the ruling on participation, participating in such ceremonies? Some people say it's okay because this is part of the customs and everybody's doing it. I personally believe that this is not a Muslim tradition. Neither these ropes are ours, nor these hats. If you come to our country and you wear the black robe with the golden stripes on the side, which is the Arab uh, um, garment worn in um, Eids and festivals and the likes, yeah, this is okay. But to wear the same ropes and black square hats, this is, in my opinion, not permissible as it's imitating the disbelievers. And Allah Azza wa knows best. We have a second short break, so stay tuned, and inshallah, we'll be right back. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Today I'm going to talk about the book Interactions of the Greatest Leader, Abu Sa'id al Khudri. Radiallahu an narrated that the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, For every hardship, disease, worry, distress, harm, and grief that a Muslim faces, and even for every thorn that pricks him, Allah will expiate some of their sins through it. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu said, I entered where the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was and I found him suffering pains of a fever. And I said, O Messenger of Allah, you are suffering severe pains of your fever. And he, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, said, Yes, I'm suffering as much as two men among you would suffer. I said to him, For that reason, will you have two rewards? He, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, said, Yes, it will be as you said. There is not a Muslim that is afflicted with the harm of a thorn or any above that, except that because of it, Allah will expiate their sins, and his sins will fall like leaves fall of a tree. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah and welcome back again. We have Abdullah from the US. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. So, uh, Sheikh, uh, my question is uh, that um, I, I have like a, I'm, a, I'm like a teenager right now, so I have like a beard, I have like a side, I have like sideburns, 
and I have some hair in the front. And I heard your video on uh, to not touch the beard. So that's what I'm doing. I'm not touching it. And so uh, my question is, uh, is it permissible, permissible for me to dye it? Okay. Dye it with what color? Uh, like the orange, orange what color. If, if you're not imitating the disbelievers and you're not, uh, um, it's totally permissible. Whether you put hinna and dye it with orange or dye it with dark brown or dye it with any other color that is normal among the people, this is totally permissible without any problem, insha'Allah. Yunus for Germany. Yunus. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Wa alaikum, assalamu alaikum, So, my question is. If someone, so I, the, thing, the thing is, my mother doesn't wear hijab and I'm getting into some difficulties. So I'm just going to tell you some things and please tell me whether any of them is prohibited and maybe elaborate. So like... We can, we can only I, have one here, Eunice. We can't take more than one. Um, so like, there is a tap, okay, and we put it for clothes, okay, uh, and then, so can I put clothes in there? Then what happens is my mother takes the, the tap then walks to the wash machine, washing machine, but the thing is, she walks past a very big window without hijab. So is this permissible? If I don't do it, she gets very angry. So uh, please explain. I hope you, I hope you know what I mean. So like, no, no, I don't know what you mean. Um, like, how much? Um, so like, my mother doesn't wear hijab, and sometimes windows windows are open in the house. Okay, and like, uh, how much attention must I pay? Not to be the cause of someone seeing her from outside, like, is it permissible to often open a window, even though my mother um, may pass? Or is it permissible to tell her to carry something, though she passes, uh, um, she passes in front of the windows? Like, uh, this is something, listen, Eunice, this is something way beyond your control. She's your mother. You can't do anything other than to advise her diplomatically. If she doesn't wear the hijab, you shouldn't be only concerned about her presence in the house, whether you open the windows or not, whether there are curtains or not. You should also be concerned with her going out, going to work, going to groceries. And this is something you cannot help. You can only advise. You can drag and pull a horse behind you for two kilometers until you reach the river, but you cannot force the horse to drink afterwards even if you bring 10 strong men. So this is something you cannot do. Make dua for her, give her pol uh, polite and diplomatic advice once every blue moon. Strengthen her iman in Allah and how Allah is all seeing, all hearing, and he sees what she's doing and Allah is not pleased with what she's doing and whatever problems and calamities that befall upon the family, it is because Allah has taken the barakah out of that family, probably because of these sins. Little by little, maybe. But living in the house, what can you do? She's not wearing the hijab. Sometimes you need to open the door. Sometimes you need to open the windows. So if your father doesn't have the jealousy and the manhood to be jealous or to take care of the business in his own home, this is not your responsibility. May Allah make things easy for you. Ayan from Pakistan. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, Sheikh, I have a question. I enroll in a course of Amazon selling. I uh, learned from Amazon selling uh, three months. Then I came to know that uh, Amazon uh, supporting Israel. So I stopped working on Amazon. Then I start uh, finding something else to do, such as dig digital marketing. So I find that every platform is controlled by Jews and they are. Okay, so basically speaking, we spoke about this so many times. What is the ruling on boycotting um, such products that are owned or they are known to support or the governments of such companies support generously Israel, directly or indirectly? And we said that boycotting is something that is Beneficial, the Prophet did it, alayhi salatu wasalam, but 
at the same time, the Prophet dealt وسلم, with Jews, with Byzantines, with Persians, while still having conflict and wars with them, which meant that business as usual. Not only that, Thumam ibn Athal, may Allah be pleased with him, when he accepted Islam, he boycotted all types of wheat and grain shipped to the idol worshippers in Mecca. So they felt the pressure and they were in deep need of such wheat and grain. After a few months, they, the enemies of the Prophet ﷺ, who were still fighting him, sent envoys to the Prophet begging him to, uh, to re uh, uh, reconsider the ties of kinship between them and to allow the wheat and grains to come to them. So the Prophet uplifted the embargo and allowed it to go in. What does this tell you? They were idol worshippers. They were enemies. They killed the companions. But the Prophet ﷺ uplifted the embargo. So this is a personal preference. If you want to boycott because you feel that it would hurt those who support Israel, good for you. This is your personal uh, way of doing it. But if you see someone not doing it or consuming their cheeseburgers or fried chicken, you cannot blame them and say, oh, shame on you. You're drinking their soft drinks. No, it's not. It's halal. So put things in perspective. Weigh things with fairness and Islamic rulings from the Quran and Sunnah. Don't just shoot from the hip like so many people do, unfortunately. Now, if you want to work for these companies and there are no platforms for you to work and you are the breadwinner, there's no problem in working with Amazon or with any other company as long as it's halal and you can't find the alternative and Allah knows best. Zakaria from the UK. Assalamu alaikum. Shantullah. Um, so basically, I don't know how to roll my tongue. So I was wondering, is this part of the um, the letter Ra? Is that part of the Makraj? And if you don't know how to roll your tongue, should you learn them? I have no idea what you're saying, Akhi. You know um, the, the trilling noise when you pronounce the, um, the Arabic letter Ra? I don't know the, 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 what you're referring to, but I think you're meaning Allahu Akbar. Or yeah, So whether you say or يشري, Allahu Akbar, there's no problem in that. Akhi. Move on. Everybody knows it's a ra. It's an R. Don't be so meticulous in perfecting it as the Qaris do. You're not a Qari. I'm not a Qari. But everyone knows Arabic, knows that you just said Allahu Akbar. You just said min sharri. Qala rabbi ghfir. Ra, ra. Everybody knows it's an R. So move on and don't let shaitan hold you back. Asna from India. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, Sheikh. Wa alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I am struggling with the pronunciations of some Arabic letters. I can pronounce all letters except Ghain and Fad. I am I'm struggling with those letters. I, I, I hear you saying it beautifully. So it seems to me that shaitan is messing up with your head. Well, so what's the problem? Recite it to me if you wish. I don't think I can do it because I am having some problems to my title. Okay, if you have problems with such pronunciations, the easiest of all solutions is say it silently. When you say غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين and you have problems with ضاد or صراط you just say it silently, listen. I said it perfectly. Yeah, but I didn't hear it, Sheikh. You don't have to. Saying it silently exempts you from the whispers of shaitan. Did my tongue reach the ceiling of my uh, uh, throat or did I do this right? Did I do? No, no, just move on. And inshallah, things would be fine. Amatullah from Pakistan. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Assalamu alaikum wa barakatuh. 
If my question is three small parts, but I will be quick. Please listen to the complete question. No, uh, no, 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 Amatullah. The question is short. Please don't prolong your question. Just ask me, what's the ruling on this? Don't give me any background or circumstances. Uh, while checking for purity following menses, after the brown discharge turns yellow and is really light yellow on the 13th or 14th day, if it turns even lighter on the 15th day as just a small dot or a line, and I notice the same thing on the 16th day, so shall I take my bath on the 15th day and continue with my salat, or shall I consider the days of yellow discharge as istihaza? And okay, if your if your yellow discharge is prevailing the majority of the month. This means that your yellowish discharge is istihada. So it cannot be like 20, 25 days of the month. This means that you have a prolonged istihada, which means that you have to go back to the days that were normal. Some women say that we used to have six to seven days in the middle of the Hijri month. And this was our istihada, fixed. For six, seven, ten years, we've been having this. And now, all of a sudden, it changed, and we're having this yellow discharge. In this case, every single month, you observe the flow of the blood, six or seven days that you usually have. And once the flow of blood stops and you have this yellowish discharge, perform your ghusl, pray, but clean yourself, make fresh wudu, after the adhan of every prayer. If you don't know and you cannot distinguish, this is an issue which is different where we have to uh, uh, distinguish when is the flow of a blood by the characteristics. But alhamdulillah, you have a fixed number of days that you get the flow of blood. Once it stops and you get this yellowish discharge that prolongs for a week, 10 days, maybe more, you consider that to be istihad and Allah knows best. Abdul Wahab from Hong Kong. Abdul Wahab. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. So my question is, I work in an airport as a baggage handler. Um, sometimes a haram package such as musical instruments uh, pass by once in a day or two. So I have to put it in a belt when I'm uh, working alone. So uh, what's the ruling on it? No problem, inshallah. You can put it on the belt. Maybe it's filled with dead cats. You never know. So just assume the best and put it, and it's once every blue moon, and it's not your uh, business to in investigate what's in it, inshallah. Omar from Egypt. Assalamu alaikum, ya Sheikh. Alaikum salam. I heard your fatwa about creating video games and that if they're halal, if they're innocent, and if they don't contain the haram. But uh, are we making, are like, is making horror games haram on the basis that its purpose is to scare people even though the game has no music or no haram content? How, like, how, yeah, Omar, how could it not have haram content if you're not going to put animation or human beings or animals? Omar. Hello? Yes, how could it be not haram? Uh, Good question, huh? It's a great question. Yeah, so <laughs> think it out, think it over, and come back again, inshallah. Uh, Yasin from Germany. Assalamualaikum, Sheikh. Assalamualaikum. Sheikh, my question is um, if somebody says the morning of Afghar, um, Asr time, would he still get the reward of saying it, or does it have to be said at Fajr time? Jazakallah uh, khairan. Yasin. Are you referring to the morning adhkar or the evening adhkar? The morning adhkar. No. If he says it at Asr time, it's over. Once the dhuhr is called, the most authentic opinion is that it's, that's it. You're not protected anymore. So be careful. Danielle from Ireland. Danielle. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Assalamu alaikum. I want to ask, you know in Salah, we cannot let the Imam go two pillars ahead of us. But if the Imam is two pillars ahead of us, what do we do in this situation? Do we just leave the Salah? Like, what do we do? What did, what, why did he become uh, two pillars ahead of you? Is it because you came late or he was too fast or you were too slow? Um, I was too slow. 
I was too slow. And then in this case, you skip this uh, rak'ah and f keep on praying with the imam, but consider this rak'ah to be void. So once he offers salam, you stand up. You don't offer salam. You stand up and make up this rak'ah as if you've missed it with him. Okay? Do I also do sujood al sahu? Of course you do. Before or after? You do it after the salam because you've added something to the prayer. Okay. Sheikh. Barakallah fiqh. Ibrahim from uh, Gi Guinea. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Wa alaikum assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Inshallah, you'll get the name right one day. <laughs> is, it, uh, is it Guinea or? It's Guinea. Yeah, it's Guinea, it's Guinea. Okay, it's right. Huh? It's right. <laughs> uh, Sheikh, I have a question here. I, I asked on Twitter, but you said it was uh, too generic, so I'll try to give a little bit details here. Actually, I know a mother who sent her son to go to some kind of, I don't know, magician, black magic, or some things about those lines to be washed, basically, because they were so thinking that maybe there was something possessed the, the guy or things about that nature, you understand? Okay. So now um, the, the, the guy actually, when he came back from that, one day we were talking, he told me that uh, actually I never went back again because it felt awkward and I even starting to believe in these things, so I, I left it. I, mean, I told him, actually, I think you should repent because what you did actually in our region is quite serious. I believe maybe it's Kufur or Shirk or something like that. Uh, and actually I wanted to ask if these people don't repent, Basically, the one who accompanied him there, him himself and the mother, if they don't repent, but they continue fasting and praying and everything, what's the ruling on that? And how can I advise them to actually repent? First of all, um, uh, Ibrahim, it is not our job to label people as disbelievers. This is a very dangerous uh, uh, route to take. So they've done something according to <coughs> the policy and procedure is an act of kufr to go to soothsayers and believe in them and believe that they have a solution or they know the unseen or they can do this and that, this is an act of apostasy or kufr. We cannot label them as such until we ensure that the conditions are fulfilled and that there are no obstacles present. Maybe they would say that, no, they're not soothsayers. They're using Quran. Maybe they are misinterpreting things or confused or don't have the necessary knowledge. So this is not your job to do. You did your due diligence and you've explained to them the gravity of the situation. Move on and leave them. Uh, Sahil from India. Assalamualaikum <laughs> Sheikh, I have uh, OCD with Salah and Wudu, which will lead with mandatory actors such as wiping overhead, Fatiha, etc. All this is making my life very hard. Sheikh, can I ignore these, these thoughts and uh, for how much time should I ignore these thoughts? You must ignore it for eternity. Whenever there is hardship and you're suffering from it, you have to acknowledge that this is from Shaitan. It's not from Islam. So... The moment you feel that this is becoming out of hand, this is from shaitan, he's messing up with your head. The best thing to do for people with OCD is to ignore. The moment they fail to ignore, they have opened the Pandora box. They've set themselves right into the trap of shaitan. May Allah protect us all. Saad from Pakistan. Good night. Alaykum Shah. Alaykum Allah. So, Chef, these days we see many videos up on YouTube and on TikTok saying that in Islam there is gender equality. Is there any truth to this or is there not? First of all, we don't have genders in Islam. We have males and females. That's it. The terminology gender was recently introduced so that they can put all the LGBTQ plus one XW, whatever they call them, whatever alphabets is remaining, into the equation. We have males and females. That's it. Now, do we have equality between males and females? The answer is no. Allah stated this in the Quran. Males are not equivalent to females. Otherwise, my wife would say, 
I'm going to take a break for five years. You get pregnant. There's no equality. However, there is fairness in Islam. So my job is, my job description is totally different than my wife's job description. I have to do what I have to do. She has to do what she has to do. And this is the fairness of Islam. But there is no equality. She cannot say, listen, you do the shores of the house the next, for, for next week. And they say, okay, next week you take the garbage out and you go do the groceries and you work at the company and earn uh, uh, living and pay the rent. It doesn't work this way. And Allah Azza wa Jal knows best. This is all the time we have until we meet tomorrow at 4 o'clock here in Mecca region. I leave you fi amanillah. والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته قل هذه سبيلي أدعو إلى الله على بصيرة أنا ومن اتبعني وسبحان الله وما أنا من المشركين